Welcome to Dakota Preparedness. Today I'd like to do a deep dive into the threat that China might invade Taiwan, therefore potentially and almost with all probability pulling the United States and Japan's military into the fight. Now, I'm a former United States Naval officer, and indeed I did some training at the amphibious base in Coronado, California. And in that training, there was an improvised 600-person battalion that we trained for an entire day how to get into an Amtrak, which is an armored amphibious vehicle, how to get in it, how to get out of it, how to hopefully get out of it if there was an emergency. In other words, it sank. And, um, and then after some training at Camp Pendleton of the Marine Corps base there, we were taken out and put on an LST, and we had to climb up a cargo net, which that in and of itself isn't as easy as it looks. That evening, we were able to get a shower, eat some Navy chow, and in the morning, we loaded on to an Amtrak's. And in my Amtrak, as it drove off the uh, end of the dock as, uh, on the LST, we had been prepared that and told that it would seem like we were in a submarine. It sank. It's armored. It's heavy. And it needs a little while for the buoyancy to take you to the surface. Now, we were also told that it would leak. And if it leaked more than over our ankles, we were in trouble. Well, it leaked way more than <laughs> over our ankles. It was uh, well up our legs. And we were seriously <laughs> considering uh, that we would have to do the emergency procedures. <laughs> I remember one boy started saying his Hail Marys, and, which I found reassuring. But after a while, it got on your nerves a little bit. And the guy next to him says, would you please stop that? Well, finally... The buoyancy uh, of the Amtrak worked, and we could see the sunlight pop through the, the windows that the Marine gunner and driver used, and we all started cheering because we were going to get to live. And uh, the, uh, the driver leaned over to the gunner, and he says, Wow, those guys are really excited about seeing sunlight. And the gunner leaned over to him, and he says, Yeah, I am too. He says, you should see all the water down there with them. So we were quite relieved when minutes after that, the uh, Amtrak, in effect, grounded on the, uh, the beach, and the tracks started turning and pulled us up out of the water onto the shore. And then as we came off like a bunch of honey badgers, the Marines were on the bluffs working us over with, with machine guns and M16s and Explosives were going off. Well, thankfully, they were all blanks. But it shows you how uh, just getting ashore is challenging. Um, so uh, don't underestimate an amphibious landing, especially in the case of Taiwan. It's estimated that they would have to get hundreds and hundreds of thousands of troops on shore, and people wouldn't be shooting blanks. Now, I would also share with you a real life historical story about an amphibious invasion. I once was speaking to a World War II veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and he told me he had been in the Pacific, and I casually said, where all were you? And he starts to name just about every campaign in the Pacific, Guadalcanal, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and and many more. And I just thought to myself, well, he, he must have been in some sort of support unit to survive all of that. And at that point, he told me I was in the first wave at Peleliu. Now, I've always been a historian of uh, military history, and I knew about the Battle of Peleliu, which was one of the fiercest battles in the Pacific. And taking an island. 
And I said to him, isn't Peleliu where the plan was for the Marines was for, at low tide, the naval battleships and um, cruisers were to blow up the reef with their gunfire. And then at high tide, the Marines and their mic boats were to go over the reef and end towards the shore. Now, a mic boat is a uh, amphibious assault vehicle that uh, is depicted well in the movie uh, Private Ryan, which um, Tom Hanks starred in at D-Day, where they drop the front and you come across, run off of it into the water or onto the beach. But in reality, what happened at Peleliu, and this shows the fog of war and what in any invasion of Taiwan would surely happen, miscalculations, misfortunes, and everything in between, is that the tide was high when the naval gunfire tried to destroy the reef and virtually didn't even damage it at all. And then to make things worse, the tide was down when the Marines tried to cross it with their mic boats, and some of them couldn't hardly get over it. So I said to him, didn't you have to wait 100 yards to shore under machine gun fire? And he said, Tom, I am, I am really impressed with your knowledge of the Battle of Pelavilu. He says, it's been years since I've met someone that knew the details like you do. But he says, Tom, it was 300 yards, murderous machine gun fire. And he says, of the 10-man squad that I was with, two of us got onto the shore, onto the sand. And then later he told me uh, the other man was killed a couple days later in the ground fighting on Peleliu. So an amphibious assault is one of the most difficult uh, military maneuvers that you can do. Let's stay with the knowledge of the United States Marine Corps and the United States Navy from World War II, which I would say, <laughs> unquestionably, they are the apex of knowledge on this subject, and especially in 1944. There was a operation called Causeway, and it was planned to invade Taiwan. And the United States military wanted to do that. They felt if they could control Taiwan, they could put long-range bombers that would be much closer than the Philippines to striking the homeland of Japan during World War II. And this uh, plan called for amassing 800 combat airplanes that would be land-based and would uh, just pulverize Taiwan of any military target of opportunity or of value for weeks before the task force set, set out and arrived at Taiwan. And the task force were multiple. They were envisioned six task force groups with three carriers each, fleet carriers, the big boys. So that would have been 18 large carriers, four battleships. So that would have been a total of 24 battleships. 12 destroyers, so 72 destroyers, and then hundreds of ships to carry the estimated invasion force of 400,000 Marines and Army troops. There was an estimated 98,000 Japanese on Taiwan, so the Americans would have a 4 to 1 odds. Now, traditionally, 3 to 1 odds just barely give the attacker uh, a reasonable chance of uh, winning. Uh, I think modern uh, ratios would be more like 6 to 10 to 1. So a tremendous effort. And to give you an idea, even with having total uh, air superiority and naval superiority, when the United States military in World War II finally invaded, Okinawa, 368 Allied ships were damaged or sunk. That includes 120 amphibious ships. 
So taking over Japan, uh, Taiwan will be a tremendous task. <clears throat> it's uh, the size of Maryland, uh, north to south. It's a large mountainous range that sometimes is 10,000 feet. It would be just a tough nut to crack. And, and indeed, in World War II, the American military said, we'll just bypass this and go to Okinawa, where something is a little more doable. So for the Chinese Navy to uh, invade Taiwan would be terribly risky. And especially with the, uh, the Chinese military has not really fought in any war for decades. So they're totally green troops. They'd be running up against uh, Air Force, American Air Force and Naval pilots who have plenty of experience in how to uh, do air operations and bomb things and shoot missiles into things. They've had decades of experience. You would also have the American subforce coming to play, and they are an apex predator. And what's not widely known is that the uh, Japanese have 20 submarines. And these aren't your granddad's submarines, like from World War II. When, uh, when you do see video of them, they look just like our fast attack submarines, which ours is nuclear powered and theirs are uh, diesel powered. But I suspect armament is pretty similar. So the... Uh, in 2024, I would predict, uh, even with the unpreparedness that is, that is a part of any war, that the uh, Chinese Navy, well, let's give them some credit. They, they'd be like a good high school football team running up against the Super Bowl champions. Now, another issue that I think the Chinese would want to weigh is to realize Taiwan is the size of Maryland, so you're not getting a big piece of real estate. And the notion that they have advanced computer manufacturing capabilities is absolutely true. But with the amount of force that it would take to conquer for Taiwan, in all likelihood that industrial base would be destroyed or severely damaged. <clears throat> and the people who work there, the engineers, they would be highly recruited by every country on the world who produces computer chips. They would get instant green cards. So they're not really, uh, in all likelihood, going to accomplish the um, acquisition of the computer chips uh, capability. So... I think the Chinese, particularly under the leadership of Xi Jinping, who is very smart, who is cunning, who is a grandmaster at world diplomats, would weigh in the odds and know this is not a gamble. This is a mistake to invade Taiwan, especially given they have a wide range of other more peaceful options. Uh, it's sort of like a uh, German businessman that I uh, met with one time. He said, yes, after World War II and the post-World War II, we in Germany, we learned that it was easier to buy Europe than to conquer it. So that would be a wiser strategy on the part of the Chinese, that over a decade or two they would uh, uh, try to foster good relations with Taiwan and, uh, and ensure uh, very close economic ties so that if nothing else, in fact, it would be a, uh, a vassal state of them. But that is not guaranteed. And it's not guaranteed that some mishap of fortune would trigger hostilities there. And uh, when uh, you start talking about sinking uh, United States aircraft carriers and attacking our bases in Japan and attacking Japan. 
it might well be the Chinese should be reminded of a statement that Admiral Yatamoto of the Japanese naval fleet after Pearl Harbor reportedly wrote in his diary, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and filled him with terrible resolve. So, that could be the sleeping giant is America, or it could also be his twin, Japan, or both. It's just an awful lot for Xi Jinping to risk everything for a country the size of Maryland. And if the people of uh, Taiwan will stand and stand firmly and fight them, it's going to be a hard fight. So they should look for other means to do it. Now, as far as individuals and thinking about world politics, I think uh, one of those, I'll call it mishaps or misjudgments, could mean that there could be some sort of warfare or even invasion this year. But I would put it at 10%. I think there's some other uh, threats that uh, are higher, more higher probability and could be more uh, threatening. Be prepared. <laughs>